We already did Casual vs Speedrun with the Great Plateau, but what would this series be without a couple of dungeons and actual tricks to show off? So now we'll try to swiftly take your heart by storm with a breeze- What do you mean I'm trying too hard? Uh, fine! We start from the plateau, head to Impa, then to Hateno Village, and back. Then, if we allow it, we are subconsciously led to Azora waiting for us next to a shrine, who then tells us to go to Zora's domain. As we continue, we find Sidon, who leads us to Zora's domain. This is a journey that can take quite some time and a few deaths on its way, with Sidon being as fabulous as a Zora can be until we finally arrive at Zora's domain. So far, not very spectacular. We start from the plateau and warp to the Magnesis Shrine. Here we walk towards the wall and collect some Hyrule Herb if necessary. If we jump off the plateau on the side here, there will always be horses waiting to be tamed by us. We have to slowly glide to them and make sure we're approaching them from behind and land on top of their backs to not chase them away. If done right, we just have to mash the L button a couple of times and we can call the horse our own. Using this horse, we will now head to the Moa Keat Shrine on the east of the map. Which horse we got is almost not important. Obviously we want a fast one, but its stamina doesn't matter as we can just perform a little trick called infinite horse sprinting. For this, we need to make sure we have a bow and a shield equipped. If we now hit CL for target, followed by A for action and CR for the shield and then X for jump, we will jump off the horse, go into action time and remount the horse, giving us back the full stamina on the horse. This sounds complicated, but it isn't too hard with a little practice. Using this horse, we can easily head to the shrine, which is between Goron City and Zora's domain, so a must-have for all longer runs. From here, it depends whether we have Revali's Gale or not. If we have it, we can just go for the wall at the foot of this hill and fly up half of it. From here, we then shield surf a little and can see Zora's Domain in the distance already. We jump off the hill and just glide to Zora's Domain without having seen a single Zora so far. If we don't have Revali Scale, we can chop off a tree, freeze and charge it with stasis and launch it upwards using an arrow to change the direction. We can now climb the tree and fly up the hill instead and just glide to Zora's domain from here. Now we get introduced to the Zoras and get the Zora Tunic. If we haven't yet, we need to collect the electrical arrows on the Lionel Field. And as a lot of people start off with this dungeon, this is the first time the player encounters a Lionel. And boy, this is a fun experience. Luckily enough, we aren't even required to beat it. We just need to evade the Lionel until we collect the 20 arrows. Once we did that, we can head back to Sidon, talk to him and start our mission to enter Varuta. He will now graciously jump into the water and explain that we first have to deactivate the barrier of Varuta. From here on, things get a little messy due to the variety of ways everything can be approached, but we'll try to keep it the way how most people approach the quest and the puzzles in general. Sidon now starts swimming around the Divine Beast which will summon three ice blocks. Almost naturally, we draw our bow with explosive arrows, if possible, to destroy the blocks that are summoned. The first three go down relatively quickly, and we get to trigger the first switch and enter phase two. It will now summon more blocks, which will shoot with our precious and very limited arrows, and continue with this procedure until we can enter. Obviously, not everyone had this option or even considered it. We could let them come closer and use our melee weapon, we could use stasis and have them run into each other, we could use other elemental arrows, or show what the speedrun would do. We start a little different. Pretty much no speedrun has not completed another dungeon yet. Optimally, Vana Boris is beaten at this point. This allows us to go to Gerudo City and just buy the electrical arrows. Once this is done, we talk to King Zora, then to Sidon, and so on. Nothing special here. After a hundred years of talking past, we head up the first stairs, chop off a tree, you know the trick already. But we just can't miss out on those epic tree rides. We now talk to Sidon and start the entrance quest. First of all, a slightly obvious yet hard to think of solution for the ice blocks. The Cryonis rune. The rune comes in really handy here, as it's not bound to any resources. Once we charge up the first waterfall, we use the glider to adjust ourselves and shoot the first two switches, ultimately skipping phase two. We now deal with phase three and hit the last two switches. If done right with stamina food, it is even possible to hit all four switches in one go, but that is rather precise as this has to be done before Varuta's barrier gets active again. So we'll just accept dealing with cycle three and enter the dungeon. 
Luckily for us, this dungeon is rather straightforward. If we consider that we haven't collected any other abilities yet, as most people complete this dungeon first. We put the Sheikah Slate on the pod and get greeted by the beautiful and hopeful voice of Mifa, who has been waiting for us for over a hundred years. We have to collect the map first, then activate the five terminals in the dungeon. Once in the temple we head to the left, deal with the malice, which is underwater so using a bomb or an arrow is the best way to go. Now we can lift the gate like we did in the Kronos trial itself and collect the map. So far no challenge. After this it's time to explore the temple a little. The first thing on this floor that catches our eye, besides the final terminal and the exit of the room, is the big gear on the wall, which we can use Magnesis on. Once we do that, the first terminal rises. Wasn't so hard, was it? We head outside and into the first floor of the dungeon where a water wheel and a rotating terminal are awaiting us. The water wheel is kept in motion by a water stream that we have to stop. Said and done, we have to deal with a mini guardian cause that little fella is really darn annoying. We activate the second terminal and go outside where more malice awaits us. We shoot it with an arrow and head to the second floor. Here is a water wheel and nothing more. We need to open the map menu and navigate the trunk of the beast so that it pours water into the dungeon itself and starts turning those gears. We wait for the ball to trigger the switch and open the door to the third terminal. When the ball is about to drop again, we freeze it with stasis to keep the door open and now we can enter the terminal. After this we can use the outside of the bigger gear to activate the switch, which allows us to come back from here from the bottom whenever we want. Outside we lower the trunk to the lowest point and fly to the fourth terminal. We raise the trunk again to access the top of the dungeon with a lot of malice and a little hole to access a small high up area that we haven't gone to yet. We drop down, get rid of the malice and open the roof with magnesis. We only have to remove the trunk once again and voila, the fifth terminal is activated. First of all, the speedrun of the dungeon isn't too different from the route that most people take when playing the game for the first time. That is, if the runner doesn't have her valley scale at this point. We enter the dungeon, get rid of the mini guardian and grab the map on the left and then head to the gear. Before we use Magnesis, we set the dungeon trunk to the fourth point from the top and activate the terminal. If we're fast enough, the terminal on the next floor is just about to be on the lower part of the gear as we arrive, so we can freeze it right away and activate this one as well. On our way to the top, we gotta be quick about getting rid of the malice, as us setting the trunk to the fourth spot was meant to time it just so that we arrive in time before the switch for the third terminal gets deactivated again. So we can use stasis right away and trigger the terminal as soon as possible. Once that happened, we set the trunk to the highest spot and paraglide onto the big gear, which will now change direction and carry us to the top. As soon as we arrive here, we set the trunk to the bottom option and paraglide to the fourth terminal. Before we arrive, however, we set it to the fifth spot from the top again and can land on top of the trunk to activate the terminal. We glide back, use the hole on top of the dungeon, get rid of the malice and then open the roof, where the trunk's position will immediately extinguish the fire and we can move on to the boss of the dungeon. It's time for the showdown with Water Blight Ganon. The fight starts simple. He attacks us with his lance that we can either shield, dodge or reflect and then attack him. Once he is knocked down we can attack him and he'll teleport away. Once phase 2 starts, the fun part begins. Four platforms rise and we don't have a lot of space anymore. In addition, he attacks us with ice blocks that he slowly throws at us. We can now either destroy them, dodge them or reflect them using stasis. Once we hit him, he'll drop to the ground and we can attack him again. What seems like a fairly simple fight can turn into a puzzle itself, especially if this is the first boss that's being fought and a player doesn't have too much experience with the game yet. Well, this fight is... one-sided. In most runs, we have the Great Eagle Bow already, so the only thing we do is to keep him under attack with either electricity or bomb arrows. This will be done until phase 2, where we then continue the procedure. There isn't anything Water Blight can do about this if we manage to hit the eye most of the time and the fight is decided in a relatively boring manner. If we don't have the Eagle Bow or not enough arrows due to unfortunate circumstances, we start the fight with a Flurry Rush as Water Blight's first attack is almost always a swing. Using this Flurry Rush we can now attack him, then use the bow to stun him again and get to phase 2, where we then will just spam arrows. 
After this fight, we ignore our rather undeserved heart container and skip Mifa's cutscene to save time. So as you can see, Breath of the Wild isn't as much about glitches as other Zelda games, but still a really interesting speedrun. But wait, what about the dungeon with Rivali's Gale? Okay, let's go! We start off by turning the gear on the right, activating the first terminal and grabbing the map. Now we head back out of the room and use up our first Rivali's Gale, while setting the trunk to the second option from the top. From here we run towards the next wall and use up another one, which brings us to the top of the dungeon. This happens at about the same time the trunk reaches its destination. On top of the dungeon, we use up our third Rivali scale to get to the terminal on the trunk. Here we set the trunk to the fifth spot to extinguish the fire and get to the next one. Trunk to the fourth spot and jump off the platform to the terminal in the water wheel. We don't even need stasis with a proper timing to enter the chamber, which will stay open as soon as the terminal is activated. We jump down even further, wait for the last terminal to reach the bottom of the water wheel, stop it and are done with the terminals. A lot quicker, don't you think? So thank you for watching this week's episode on casual vs speedrun. We hope you enjoyed the video and hope you have a nice weekend. Yep, I sure have no clue what to say this time.